Thanks. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for showing up this evening. My name is Thomas O'Neill, and this is Denise Marchesoto. And my old cross-country teacher and school teacher from Chapin, Mr. Gingell, in the back. And these folks have been uh, critical in assisting me with discovering a really interesting secret about uh, my ancestors that I'd like to share with you tonight, and I think you're going to find it very interesting. Ezekiel's March is something that uh, we put together that celebrates not only my ancestor and, and the Patriots, and of course General Washington and the uh, brave actions that they did, they did at Princeton, but we also highlighted the uh, unity of African American and uh, white soldiers that fought together at these battles. You know, we're trying to make well, we're trying, it's working, you know, we're getting a lot of support from people to see the value and the healing power in what we're doing, and um, we're here to talk a little bit more about that. And we're going to talk about a foundation called Ezekiel's Dream that we're going to start here this quarter that we're very excited about. And, um, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. And, of course, we'll talk about the march itself. <clears throat> Last time I was at Lawrenceville was 25 years ago. <laughs> And we didn't have mobile phone, you know, none of this digital smartphones or anything. I remember I had a, uh, I was delivering pizza, Barnesville Pizza, right here in the corner, which is now something else. Um, and, you know, this town was, still remains uh, one that I'm very loyal and committed to. And I always had this loyalty to Lawrence, and now I'm figuring out why, you know, because I, I learned this uh, really interesting uh, history about not only my family, but the families that were operating in this area and were critical in assisting General Washington uh, with his campaign in New Jersey. And there was absolutely no way that we would have won those battles at Trenton and Princeton without the men of the 1st hundred in militia. You're going to hear that throughout uh, this evening's presentation. So I, um, again, Ezekiel's March went down on, on the 2nd, 3rd of January 2017, uh, and we commemorated General Washington's march from Trent to Princeton, and of course that turned the tide of the war, and I came back from a <coughs> decade of supporting American foreign policy and uh, the campaigns of Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, which we all know can be a little bit... Uh, not, not real clear and, uh, you know, a little bit confusing. So I was, I was confused myself in 2013. And this is a photo of me in an area where there's no, no wall, no government. You know, the, the crop there is opium, you know, the poppies, and, you know, like the farmers were going to die for it. You know, it's just a really dangerous situation that I was living in, operating in, helping our government out and the Afghan government with uh, creating a sovereign government. Uh, which was very, very difficult and still remains very challenging. So I decided to come back home to uh, give up that kind of lifestyle and focus on um, becoming an American again and also helping my mother. She was older and uh, requires caregiving, which I'm doing right now while doing this, this really interesting research. Um, and I discovered from my mother and her brother, uh, who there was a woman here that was just Franklin and left, um, of my uncle. And he gave me the name of this ancestor that I had I'd heard of my whole life. Growing up, I always heard that we had a, a, a relative of ours that was in the boat with General Washington. And I'd heard that over the years, you know, growing up, and didn't really pay any attention to it. So when I came home uh, in 2013, and then, you know, it, just the whole country seemed, as we were talking before, just paralyzed and all this other stuff, whatever you want to call it, but uh, I felt that by looking into my history that I could start to remember who we really were again. Now, if this was true and I had a revolutionary, you know, somebody that was a, 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 this, an ancestor that was helping out, maybe this is a way that I can uh, discover not only who I am, but what this country is again, you know. Um, we've got to go back and really talk about how unique the history of New Jersey is and how it really set the conditions for us to win the war and so on and so forth. But the politics 
building up to that is really interesting, you know. Um, and you, you look back to uh, the history of New Jersey going back to 1664. The British took over Dutch colonies, right? I mean, the Dutch were here doing their thing. My ancestors were living peacefully, Presbyterians, farmers, trying to get away from Long Island, get away from the king's influence. So, uh, you know, this, they take over, the British come in, they take over all this territory, and you know, Lord John Lord Berkeley uh, gets a grant given to him by the Duke of York for all this, there it is, West Jersey, right there, uh, all in yellow. Jersey was separated by East and West Jersey. <coughs> Lord Berkeley utilizes proprietors, his agents, to buy and sell land from Indians and colonists, acting on his behalf to acquire, sell, what have you. Berkeley goes bankrupt. He sells all his holdings to a group of Quakers to include William Penn and Dr. Daniel Cox. He was a royal doctor. He never came to England or uh, to America, lived in England. And uh, they wanted to create a Quaker haven. All right, and I assume Cox is kind of in there as an investor or whatever, but you know, whenever you see these British agents, they're working for the king, you know. So this was a really interesting uh, example of how the king could utilize geopolitical influence without really you know, moving forces. You know, he could use these agents or whatever. We'll talk a little bit more about that and see how it really affected the people of Huntington County in the mid-18th century. Cox, again, you know, he sees the potential, again, uh, from England. He eventually picks up 20% of West Jersey. Province Line Road, right? We all know where that is, right? That divided the province east and west. 1687, Dr. Cox becomes the absentee governor of West Jersey. So we've got, again, a lot of uh, just farmers, Presbyterian farmers and Quakers. These colonists are walking around trying to make as much money. Lenape Indians are still there, friendly with us. Okay, the Lenape Indians sold the property to <coughs> proprietors. Okay, for instance, Maidenhead here, this whole track. This guy Thomas Budd came in here before anybody bought land for Cox. Okay, so I mean, um, some say they swindled Indians, you know, with shiny objects. Uh, I'm not going to comment on that, but you hear our president story. 1694, Cox sells his land holdings to a group of, group of investors called the West Jersey Society. No deeds are recorded. That's going to be a problem, as you'll see 30, 40 years from all of this. Okay, so things seem very copacetic uh, in the colony for these farmers. You know, they're getting away from the king's influence up in New York and Long Island, comfortable about having a free life. Religious liberty, right? Mainly getting away from the Anglican Church, you know, because you know that that whole thing, you know, was we can talk about the Anglican Church, but from you know, one can easily say that that's just an extension of the King's, you know, geopolitics. So um, they were, for the most part, not bothered. So let's look at one particular case. And that is the case of Mr. Enoch Anderson, who arrived to the Trenton area from Midtown, Long Island in 1698. Him and his two brothers came down. Uh, Enoch and his brother Joshua ended up fighting in King William War for New York against the French invasion in New York and all of it, which is another one of these bloody campaigns where you know, the, you know, the French are using the Indians, the British are using the Indians. We get into that, the French and Indian War, they send these, well, I'm not going to call them, you know, these Indians, some will call them savages. They would go into colonial settlements and kill everybody and then desecrate the corpses. Sorry to say, but that was a way, basically, to say, you know, stay out of this area, you know, unfortunately. In those times, they were very barbaric, and the Indians were very barbaric. And, you know, they were, you might have been getting manipulated by people, and it was just an unfortunate situation. But Joshua Anderson gets 32 ounces of silver for his military service, and Mr. Enoch didn't get paid until 1717. So that's 28, 28 years later. Um, he got it. But, you know, one, we can assume that maybe Joshua took some of that silver uh, and bought more land with his brothers. Uh, the other brother, Cornelius, 
and these two brothers, Enoch and Joshua, and 28 other maiden headmen started the Lawrenceville Presbyterian Church right over here. That was in 1698. So these guys, like Enoch Anderson, you know, he, he comes to he comes down to New Jersey, he fights in the war, he's farming, he's a productive member of society. Like all the other God-fearing Presbyterians that he's very close with, Maidenhead now begins to grow and flourish in the early 18th century. Hunterdon County was part of the breadbasket uh, for wheat and hemp for the King's infantry and navy. What's hemp? Rope. Rope and wheat are probably outside of gold and silver are probably the most valuable commodity uh, in, you know, in colonial uh, America. Um, and the king would take the hemp and the wheat. He would grind it up, they'd have it grind it in mills and trend, put it on a boat down in Philadelphia, whatever. A lot of the stuff would go right on the British uh, ships and end up in the West Indies or other parts of the world where the British were conducting operations. Rope was found on ships that were sailing into, rope from New Jersey was found on ships that were sailing into India. You know, that's pretty cool. You know, when you start, you start talking about the trend, the trend makes the world change. You know, we were doing it in 1698. You know, that's pretty cool. You know, no one else was doing that. So the king realized how special the place was, you know, by, because the, the wheat was so good and the, the soil was so good that it was the best soil in the 13 colonies. You know, then you, you've got, a, you know, the, country, the state is surrounded by water. You know, you got the Delaware, you know, on the west, and then the peninsula, and then, of course, the uh, beach on the east. So the soil is amazing, you know. Upper Road, which is right out here, 206, becomes the most popular road in the 13 colonies. Why would it be the most popular road in the 13 colonies, anybody? Exactly. And how about this? They could actually have a next day mail service from Philadelphia to New York. Literally. And they would stay, the riders would stay over here in Maidenhead at a hotel, drop a bag off, and go in a different direction. So one day mail service is pretty cool. I mean, that's, you know, so, I mean these were innovative thinkers um, with uh, very mind on commerce, you know, and, and trying to make as much money as possible. And the people of Maidenhead were known as gentlemen farmers, good people, liberal, kind, um, but probably serious, you know, not, not people that you would not want to, um, you know, uh, take advantage of. Because they're tired of it. Think about it. Think about that colonial plight, you know, from the, the mid-17th Century coming down from you know, Long Island, just that whole saga, just trying to get away from the kid, you know, the corruption. Enoch continues to do well. Mr. Anderson continues to do well in, the, in, the, in his new world here. He becomes the overseer of the roads and maidenhead. And he becomes a constable, a tavern owner, a coroner, a freeholder. Okay? So that's a very admirable life, you know, for a guy to come on down and, and, and uh, contribute and take these jobs. He also provided the land and helped build the first Presbyterian church in Trenton. So this is the second church Enoch has been involved in, Presbyterian church. So, like, directly involved. His son Joshua becomes one of the most well-known and respected local ministers in the colony of New Jersey, maybe even the 13 colonies. So as John gets older and his sons are getting older, his, uh, I'm sorry, Enoch gets older and his sons are getting older, John, Captain John Anderson, becomes, I guess, uh, he's born in 1694 and he can, continues his father's success and he actually becomes commander of the Maidenhead Militia here in 1727. So John and Captain John Anderson controlled the police uh, in this area. Okay, and he also controlled things like the freeholder. Again, he took all these different jobs uh, to help the community. All his friends, people like John Philip, I'm sorry, Joseph Phillips, who owned the tavern with, uh, with John from you know, mid 17. The family owned the tavern for, for the whole time they were here. Enoch owned the tavern. 
And that was right here, um, and he kept giving it down to his, his family members. And this tavern became one of the most popular taverns in the 13 colonies. Um, you know, so we're starting to see that Maidenhead is a very important place because of you know, the crops that they're growing, the location, the fact that it's liberal, it's got these new kind of religious you know, thinkers, and the proprietors realize that the populace can't be really touched as much because the militia, you know, is controlled by the populace. So, you know, the, the, the king and the governors have their hands tied in this because how are they going to enforce laws when the people that are supposed to carry out the king's laws are the local people that they're trying to arrest? Does that make sense? Okay. So I guess uh, this is great. We talked about no deeds with Mr. Cox Sr., Dr. Cox Sr. Well, his son shows up in 1702, immediately when the colony becomes a royal colony. So this guy shows up. He says all land deal was executed by his father, his dead father, only covered the right to use the property, not to own it. So imagine, you know, you're on the property for 20 years, you, your family, is, you know, you might have buried relatives on the property, but say, then somebody shows up, some, some guy from, you know, Europe or uh, England says, well, you don't own the property. So, demands for payment for land from colonists at excessive pricing, and he hopes to drive them off the land and in some cases it's successful. Why would he want to drive them off the land? Anybody? Somewhere in the south? What's on the land? The crop? I mean, does the king like the land? What if the king of England started having financial difficulties? Would he want to pay for the wheat of the land? Maybe he says, I don't want to pay for this wheat. And this is just a theory, because we see a pattern of harassment here. <coughs> and you wonder why, okay, because this goes on for 40 years. Nobody was, you know, th th this, this was a really serious problem, and initially nobody took it seriously, and then, the, you know, he had no way to enforce his claim, because everybody in the courts was made up of colonists, and everybody knew each other, so there was basically corruption there uh, for the colonists. Corruption for justice, maybe. Cox Jr. continues to harass the populace for up to 40 years, often on either him or his agents. You know, um, and then some people do give up and they move to Maryland. Some people put off and have had it. I'm not this ridiculous new one. You know, then they pack up, they get their wagons, they go down. Was best friends with John Anderson and was a loudmouth, not loudmouth, excuse me. He was a guy that was calling out the government all the time, saying, you know, this, you know sticking up for justice and he was held in the highest regard. He was John Anderson's best friend. Um, you know, so all this stuff was going on. Now John Dickinson, Jonathan Dickinson, is also hanging around the people of Maidenhead. He's coming from the new side of Presbyterianism. He he was started a schism in the Presbyterian Church after the New Awakening. Was it was a New Awakening or the Age of Enlightenment. Great Awakening. So, okay. Pardon me. Yeah. You know, was there a political reason behind that? Who knows? But he split off. And he, it was his idea to approach Governor Morris about this university. Because again, he wants to create a institution where he can train his traveling ministers, educate them to the fullest extent, you know, and that's great, you know. To have these really brilliant, well-educated ministers, great. The families of Maiden had supported Dickinson and the new side. And they were sure they were all hopeful about that college being built. Again, Morris denied the request because he was an Anglican who opposed the Great Awakening and uh, was concerned of, again, of the Quakers and the proprietors, but how they would react to it. Which, but again, we talked about it's probably just because he was an Anglican and he didn't want, he didn't want, uh, want them to have that power. 1746, again, in my opinion, is when New Jersey was a truly independent Jersey. John Hamilton steps in as acting governor after Morris dies. What does he do?
do when he, uh, he comes in as acting governor? Immediately signs off on the request to build the College of New Jersey. And he supports the election of a three-man council to run New Jersey. Those three men, Captain John Anderson, Edmund Mabridge, and David Greer, elected by the colonists as leaders of the colony. All three are made and met. The new militia law of 1746. Wow, all this stuff going on in 1746. It protected the colonists from royal pressures. It was all, it was a new document that really protected the colonists from, you know, getting called out by any British guys or anything like that. So within Morris dies in, in 1746, and John Hamilton steps in, he's his lawyer, immediately, and signs off on all the stuff that Morris didn't sign off on. Weird. Right around this time, too, Andrew, uh, David Burley, again, he gets arrested for, for, you know, for standing on a corner and saying you know, the king is, you know, going through his own. And somebody arrested him that was supporting the king and brought him down to a jailhouse in Trenton. John Anderson leads a mob of maidenhead men to go down to Trenton, and they break him out. From that point on, they openly refuse any authority from the king, first documented revolt against the king in the 13 colonies. That moment there was the first documented revolt against the king of England in the 13 colonies. So that's another nice history fact. The first revolt against the king of England was done by May 9th in 1746, 30 years before we started the American War of Independence. Threatening letters were sent to the king by people from Hunter County, basically, uh, you know, saying bad words and, and so forth, uh, and, and taunting the king, saying, what are you going to do? You know, like, we have a fully armed militia. What, there's nothing that you can do, again, and we're not scared of you. So, you know, very frustrated, probably, uh, the king was very frustrated. The next step for him would be March Red comes right down in uh, Hunter County and start killing people. You know what I mean? So that, you know, he was trying to, it was a counterinsurgency uh, environment, essentially, a startup insurgency, excuse me, that you know, is very difficult to manage. So, we talked about John Hamilton and him being a lawyer for, for Morris. And don't you think it's strange how Morris dies in 46 and all of a sudden all this stuff happens in a year? Well, the new governor came in 47, one year after the death of Governor Morris. Exactly one year. John Belcher shows up from the <coughs> and he, you know, right off the bat, cancels everything. No, the, 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 the charter that you signed with, with the Presbyterians in Princeton, that's, that's not going to work. The new militia law, that's not going to work. I'll let the three guys manage the economy. You know, this, this governor's going in with no leverage. You know, he's coming into the 13 colonies, and it's like, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a target, almost. So, after conducting all this research, I believe that Governor Morris was poisoned by John Hamilton. I believe that John... Hamilton, his lawyer, poisoned Lewis Morris because <coughs> of that Presbyterian agenda. And I think they gave him a large land. And people like John Anderson and his brother, Eliakim, had tons of land. And I believe they gave John Hamilton land in order to conspire in that nefarious act, which was a great act for us as a college college, because once Morris died, it's like, that was it. No one knows. The, the Hamilton Township, New Jersey, you can Google it and get on Wikipedia right now, and it will say, people think it's named after Alexander Hamilton. No one knows this. This, John Hamilton, is who Hamilton Township is named after. It's named after. A lawyer who poisoned Governor Morris for the for the colonists. That's my theory, and I and I can talk about this and prove it any time in a big sense. 
um, because of all these incredible changes. John Belcher, you know, when he shows up in 47, like I said, he can't study. He's there for maybe 15 years. He develops a strange condition that takes him out of any kind of work. Both of his hands become completely paralyzed. Another symptom of being poisoned. All right. So I think maybe somebody tried to poison John Belcher as well, the second governor of New Jersey that came in for a dead horse. Okay. And the thing, the reason I I, I stick with this uh, assassinate, assassination theory on Morris is because I spent hours researching where Morris died and how he died, and it's the same thing. Died near Trent in 1746. Died near Trent, not how. So after that assassination, New Jersey enjoyed autonomy for 15 years, okay? And it pretty much ran itself. You had guys like John Belcher trying to reestablish power. Um, but, you know, the, the British government really, uh, when the French Indian War came in, started in 1750, that was a good distraction for everything because it's, now we got to get people out to the frontier. Okay, you know, it's a distraction. Kind of like what Putin's doing here with all his acrobats, you know, all this stuff he's doing. These, these are just distractions. <clears throat> and that, that might be one benefit to the king of having, you know, the French and Indian War as well. We can now focus on another enemy, which is, you know, our own enemy. So John Anderson and the families of uh, Maidenhead continued to do very well and prosper and buy more land. And uh, John's brother, Eliakim, had all this property in Hamilton, which is now Greenwood Cemetery. And then this guy here, Ezekiel. John has a son named Ezekiel, right? Ezekiel Anderson. He was born in Maidenhead. 1740, the youngest son of John. And uh, he's known for being uh, selected, interviewed and selected by General Washington uh, and two other men during uh, the, I don't know, that week in between Trent and Princeton where they were running around, you know, between Newtown, back to Newtown. The reason, by the way, that Washington pulled everybody out of Trenton so quickly, anyone want to take a guess why General Washington pulled the Yankees out of Trenton probably within two hours of attacking the Hessians? Anybody? Yeah. Uh, no? Good answers. Yeah, reinforcements of Hessians. Anyone else? They were afraid, General Washington was afraid of the taverns in Trenton. He was afraid his men were going to get drunk. I'm serious. I'm, dead, I'm serious. See, he was like, okay, we can get him out, get him back to Newtown because everybody's going to get hammered. And because that's what they did back then. You know, they drank when, when, you know, it was a, it was a very rough uh, time. So, Ezekiel made a living um, as a farmer on his on land that his father left him. He had an 80 acre farm right out here at Penn's Neck, right next to the battlefield. And uh, he had a brother named Captain Ephraim Anderson who was, had an email, it was basically what Larry Kidder uh, mentions, again, uh, the great Larry Kidder that we got a lot of our information from. Um, and he actually participated in several covert operations for General Washington, specifically during the Battle of Quebec, when he led about 20 guys to build <laughs> fire ships, which were these big wooden ships with explosives. And this guy was going to sail him into Quebec Harbor at night. British spies found out about it. They put a big steel cable across the uh, water. And the ship ended up, you know, catching on fire and exploding. This guy was Captain Anderson was blown out of the uh, boat. And he was uh, healing during the Battle of Trent. He had all these burns. And he, he was living on this plantation, which is now Trenton Country Club and New Jersey Manufacturing, 240 acres there in the Delaware. Um, so he sat out from Trenton, and I believe Princeton, but Captain Anderson. Now, Ezekiel leads the Yankees on this incredibly heroic uh, endeavor that we're going to talk about in a second. And becomes very famous, locally, whatever. And six months later, his older brother tries to outdo him on the battlefield in Short Hills, during the Battle of Short Hills. And he nobly, you know, essentially runs out in front of his guys you know, with a sword like General Washington, and it doesn't work out that way, okay? 
he gets blown to pieces by a great shot fired from the British cannon, and you know he dies there. He's the, one of the first, I think, one of the only casualties we had from Lawrence in the Revolutionary War. Captain Ethan Anderson, may he rest in peace. His uh, his younger brother had better luck, Ezekiel. And uh, when General Washington was in a desperate situation and. Uh, right after Christmas in 1776, and he said, you know, how are we gonna, we have one last shot here, and Cornall Corn Cornwallis, Ward Cornwallis, who was the you know, division commander, essentially, that was, you know, really, he's had enough of these guys. He's had enough of these patriots, and they should have been smashed. I mean, think about it, they've got this huge army with well-trained, well-equipped, and Washington is just running around with his army, you know, like, essentially outmaneuvering. Then on the night of 2 January 1777, uh, Washington, after talking to Ezekiel and Elias Phillips and John Lamb, two other men from the first, first hundred in militia, he decides, I'm going to go for it. We're going to try to go around Cornwallis when he's coming down the upper road. And where is the upper road again, ladies and gentlemen? That's correct. So Cornwallis is moving his infantry, the 55th, and they're going to kill everybody, you know. They're coming down this road, and what he's going to say, and that's the only road, really. And then, he, then he, guys like Ezekiel and two other guys, the last thing is, pass around, you know, Trenton that we can go out around them. The swampy areas where, we, where I have a farm, you know, and my uncle's got property kind of thing, we can get around them. And, and Washington had a war council, and he said, well, what's the temperature like? What about the ice? And it's really clear question. And the thing that sealed the deal was the temperature was frozen that night. It was 28 degrees, and the mud froze. And if the mud didn't freeze, they couldn't have completed that maneuver. Okay? Um, and because they completed that maneuver, so they left at uh, midnight or 10 or 11 o'clock, and John, Rod, John Hand, Colonel Hand, was at the same time, or right around that time, running these brilliant delaying actions with his Pennsylvania rifle, the right of Maidenhead, which culminated in the Battle of Aston Penn Creek, which sits on John Anderson's property. Um, and, you know, that, that was just brilliant. You know, that everything worked out beautifully. As soon as, you know, then they put these fires in Trenton, you know, the deception, you know, it was just incredibly, uh, just it was great. The plan worked beautifully, uh, and the, the Yankees had 5,000 men that they moved out of Trenton at midnight. The order was no one. Was, General Washington said, "No one says one word for 15 miles." That's pretty impressive. And the cannons were covered with blankets and so and, and to muffle the, the sound of the cannon. And they did. You know, they 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 walked out there and. You know, they were quiet and freezing, and they didn't eat, and, you know, I, mean, I just can't imagine how difficult that must have been. You know, these guys had, uh, barely had shoes on. The battle itself was awful, you know. I mean, you read some of the first-hand accounts of, uh, of what went on in that battlefield. It was only 15 minutes, but we came right in, into their back, you know, right, we surprised them, you know. Um, and we got them in the, literally in the perfect place where at the rear of one of their regiments and everybody had to try to turn around and it just broke all three of the regiments that were all along skyrunning. The bedlam that ensued, the ranks broke. And you know, within 15 minutes, three of the king's finest regiments were no more. And that's incredible. I mean it's extraordinary if you look at military history and you know you, you compare, you know, what we had and what they had, and we won. Man, that, that's something that we should all think about every day uh, and remember and embrace, you know. But the battle itself was awful. I mean, they hated us. The British hated us, and we hated them. I mean, there was a case, General Mercer, for instance. We all know what happened to him, right, unfortunately? They thought he was General Washington, and he got basically knocked off his horse, and then the, the Redcoats surrounded him. And he was refusing to give up, and they just, they stabbed him multiple times with their bayonet. They hit him with the butt of their rifle, and they 
really just made him brain, da brain damage right there. They hit him so hard. They thought it was Washington. They're, they're, and they call him the rebel scum and all that. They walked away. Some guys ran out and they grabbed Mercer and they brought him under the Mercer rope there and they propped him up. And you know, the Scottish doctor who was Washington's best friend was, uh, you know, he, he, was, he was on his way out. And he, they brought him into the Clark House after the battle. He spent seven days there and he died. And they renamed Hunter County, parts of it, Mercer County, after uh, General Mercer. What a hero. Other accounts were you know, 20 or an 18-year-old lieutenant from Virginia that was trying, was out in the middle of the battle, lost his weapon, was trying to get quarter. They shot him right in the chest and stabbed him 12 times with a bayonet. I mean, awful stuff, you know. Um, but they held it together, you know. And what held them together was the American spirit. And a French cavalry, a French staff officer was watching about Princeton. He mentioned something that he watched. He said, when I looked out there and I saw these fierce, you know, patriots fighting against these guys, and they looked awful, you know, they had barely had any clothes on, you know, whatever, but they were lining up next to them and they just were fearless. And speckled in there was African Americans, black guys fighting with white guys, you know, and this French guy's like, holy cow, look at this, you know, I mean, this is, you know, it's unbelievable. But they did it. And I started, when I was researching this battle, and I read this, I said, you know, that is just a great fact that we need to start socializing, you know. Um, and then I did some more research, and I found out the first casualty of the American War of Independence was African American. You know, so why are we talking about these things in lieu of, you know, some of the things that I talked about before, coming back to a country that's divided and all this stuff? I felt after discovering this, that this was something that we need to celebrate. That particular aspect of it. This, you know, Ezekiel's great and everything, and that's fine, you know, and Washington, but the fact that blacks and whites together did this um, was to me very inspiring, and I became motivated to try to make something out of that. And I called my friend Leo Bridgewater from Trenton. And I told him about all of this. And he's a great guy. He's a war veteran. He's in Iraq as well. And we're very close, you know. And he's from Trenton. He's born and raised in Trenton. He's a year, old, a year younger than me. Went to Trenton High. I went to Lawrence, you know. Born in the same hospital. Helene Fold Hospital. And I said, you know, did you know this? He goes, no, I didn't know this. I said, uh, well, why don't we do this together and we document it and we can maybe share it with other people. And perhaps that'll enable people to stop yelling at each other um, and, and tone all this down. And he said, yeah, it's a great idea. And um, so I we got into this project called Ezekiel's March. And, uh, and I'd like to ask Denise, my friend Denise, if she can come up here and talk a little bit more about that. How's that so? Thank you very much. And I'll take some more questions after that, OK? So, super. Um, thanks, Tom. Um, I just want to say that this has been like an amazing journey with my friend Tom, and um, to go through, he just learned all this like last April, so like six months ago. Um, we went to all the big historic libraries around here and basically entered through Bollywood and found his ancestors going all the way back to Holland. And, you know, coming down uh, the great Dutch migration from uh, Staten Island and <coughs> all into New Jersey, and of course, finally out to Pennsylvania, the Dutch. Um, but they were well known. They settled all of New Jersey. I mean, not from East Brunswick, and New Brunswick very much has all, a lot of remnants of the Dutch settlements. So, um, so it's been a really interesting and an honor to work with him and discover all this. So when, when we came up with Ezekiel's March, when, when Tom did, he wanted to gather and make it more meaningful for when he found a country divided, you know. And so we, we uh, teamed up with, with um, Leo and we all did the march. Um, so... Yeah. Give it a couple of seconds to hear it. Um, again, to... 
see if we could somehow unite the people um, of this country and stand in solidarity and strength as we did 240 years ago. Um, so this is our friend Leo, and we all walked it together, and another friend of ours, Ben, who's been here for a long time, his family also. Um, he's from Trenton, he did six tours overseas. Um, he's gonna be here tonight, he has something else. Um, so it's been really a good thing to, to join together with him. Um, so this is the four of us uh, at Obelisk Four. <laughs> And thanks to Steve, we got all the, the whole group, um, you know, it's by obelisk by obelisk. The first one being at the Sun Center in Trenton, and then basically the back way through Hamilton and back in back of the Clark House, um, down Quaker Ridge Road, and the 12th obelisk was right behind the Clark House. Um, there's one right by the Quaker Ridge Road and then a couple in, you know, so it's pretty cool. Is that written out in the book? Yes, if you want, I can email you. We have a list of all that, how many, you know, how there's one in the Greenwood Cemetery, there's one right in the middle of Quaker Ridge Road where that big tree is, mm -hmm. um, there's one by Young's Road, um, and then we go over Route 1, right up Quaker Ridge Road, and then there's one, oh, you know, like um, Shop Right, Home Depot, and as soon as you go into the swamp area where they put that bridge that's flooded, there's one right there. Right, and then you turn right and go behind there. Mm -hmm. And right after the up, up that house, mm -hmm. shortly after that there's one. And that's where you know to turn in. You should mm -hmm. see the whole uh, tree line. And then that's the work that goes behind. You go like this, you make a right, and then you're, you're literally behind the Clark house. Mm -hmm. The 12th one is. Uh, so um, I wasn't sure if I could actually complete the 15 miles, but we did it. We all did it. And we all sort of encouraged each other. And every five miles, we, we had actually a police escort, which was really awesome, thanks to Steve. And um, mm -hmm. every five miles, we sort of collapse into the, the wagon, you know, and then revive ourselves into the next five miles. It was, it was really amazing. And that night, the night before, it was freezing, freezingly cold. And then that night, all of a sudden, it warmed up to like 45, and it actually got warmer as the night went on, which was remarkable. The following night was freezing cold, and then when the you know, in that reenacting people uh, 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 this last Saturday, oh my goodness, it was so cold, literally cold. Yeah. You are you were you part of that? No. Oh, when you went out, yeah, 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 yeah. It, was, it, was, it was yeah, it was cold. So we were like 25 degrees warmer than it was brutal. It was a really heavy duty walk, and I always say to Tom, it's like. Okay, so then you manage, you crawl up, and you're like, okay, we're here, it's like, let's go home to the bed. Then, then, then these poor people, these men have to like, basically like, fight a battle, right? So it's like all hands on deck, adrenaline pull. And to actually go through that was really, really interesting and really cool. And it really made me appreciate um, where we all come from in this country, you know? And I never felt it so much as doing this, this walk. And, as a result of that, we decided that um, Tom felt like, let's make this, first of all, a yearly event, and let's set up a foundation to do leadership work um, and connect it all with the people in Trenton, the young people. Um, so that's what we're planning on doing. Um, uh, this is just all the whole group. Why don't you talk about that, Ralph, a little bit, please? Where did we start? The barracks and then what? They went up right, to yeah, so we started with, and we didn't even know that Tom's ancestors had started the uh, Trenton Presbyterian Church. We found that out a few days later, like after we were home, we are like, oh my gosh, look at this. You know, we were reviewing notes. We were at the day at the library and other places. So, right, we started the uh, Trenton Presbyterian Church, then walked down to the barracks, right, and then out of Trenton, and then down Hamilton Avenue, right? And that was a little sketchy area right there, you know, but, um, and then we ended up at Greenwood Cemetery, and then there's a VFW, that's another obelisk. Um, and then basically around, you know, like we said, through the swamps and... Uh, can everybody see where Lawrenceville is on that map? And we can see how this maneuver outflanks that road? Right, yeah. completely outflanks the British. 
And Lord Cornwallis, uh, when he went to bed the night before, he literally said, we'll get the old fox in the morning. And in the morning, the old fox got him. Right. <laughs> Sorry. And the, 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 about the Princeton battle, um, you know, Washington rode out and in the fire and a cloud of muskets, you know, all of a sudden, like, you think he's completely gone and he, he emerges from the clouds of the muskets alive. <coughs> It was almost, it was pretty remarkable. It was like a, a, a moment in time. Um, so this is all the press we got um, over the last few weeks. Uh, this is the um, town topics. Um, this is the Princeton Packet, a wonderful article. Um, this is Stars and Stripes, and it's an online uh, publication. And this is the Trentonian, who also wrote another article a few months ago. And uh, this is channel six. If we if we could have that link, you think, would that? Go ahead and try it. See if yeah. it works. I, I, I'm not sure it is that one. Is it wi -Fi? Yes. It, either way, it's fine. It just shows us a bunch of things. Can you need the sound? I think it's possible. So um, we're we're we, we we're going to create the Ezekiel's Dream Foundation. It's going to be a nonprofit. Um, and um, to benefit the, the, the youth of Trenton by adding to the positive reinforcement of sound, of sound role models of immunity through patients, cooperation, and understanding. And we have uh, linked up uh, recently with um, an organization in Trenton that Leo and his wife uh, were uh, um, and um, it's the um, sorry, I can't read it. Young Scholars Institute. Exactly. And um, what's it called? It's the Young Scholars Institute. Right. And um, Miss Jerry Morrison is the manager of it. Wonderful lady who's been supporting the younger folks in Trenton, getting them to years. Leo's wife he got a PhD under her two of that's, that's good for these things. Yeah. Appreciate it. Um, so we're really, really excited about this uh, foundation because we're getting a lot of support from everybody. You know, when, when, uh, when we talk about the idea of the minus, somebody says, you know, that's a great idea. Um, so we're happy that we're thrilled that we can uh, do something that might make things better. So uh, we're going to continue to push this and every year hopefully do more as he feels marches and uh, definitely looking to have a long term effect on the use of thread through this program. Again, we, we met with Young Scholars last night, Miss Jerry Morrison, and, and she's just amazing. It's uh, to listen to her stories talking about kids that grew up on Passaic Avenue, you know, that are walking down the street, uh, you know, with guys dealing drugs and all this crazy stuff, and you know, they're just trying to get an education, you know. And they want you know, people want a chance, you know what I'm saying? So she, she's been dedicating her life to this, um, and she's had tremendous success. And uh, these are the kind of people that we want to be partners with, and we're looking forward to that. We have that capability once we get this nonprofit up to get money right into the system and try this way. Okay. So, of course, we welcome your interest in our foundation. Any support uh, that you can help us with, we'd love, we'd love to hear it, and uh, we appreciate it. And we hope that you can understand the history of Maidenhead in Hunterdon County and realize that the farmers that are all buried in that church right over there, and you can go over there and see some real heroes like Colonel Joseph Phillips um, and others, the Brearleys. And they're all from Maidenhead, and they all help win the word independence. So 
That's the intent of all this, is to uh, let you folks know that we have all these heroes in the history here, right in our backyard, made us the country we are today. And I appreciate your time tonight. And uh, thanks for coming out. I'd like to open up the questions. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. It really is wonderful to be here. Yes, sir. <clears throat> sir, thank you. Um, something like 25%, maybe 3% of the American soldiers were black. Uh, at the time, were all soldiers uh, equals, or was there uh, uh, stratified treatment uh, within the Army? It's a great question. I'm going to say on the battlefield, everybody was equal, you know? I mean, because... But, but again, the reality of it, when they got off, sure, so I'm, I'm, I am sure that a percentage, a significant percentage of those African Americans were slaves fighting for freedom. There were free men in there that were fighting. Um, so yes, I, I, I think uh, ultimately everybody wanted to win, you know, uh, but there was still had that tension there. From, from a class perspective of slaves and non-slaves, you know. And one other question? Yes, sir. The Battle of Assunpink Creek, was that at uh, more or less Darrow Lane? 7-Eleven. Okay, Notre Dame, okay. Right, yeah, right that bridge, right there. I'm sorry? Notre, no, I'm sorry, Notre Dame? Notre Dame, yes. Right, there was a bridge right there, and they basically, the creek and the bridge, they just held them over and held them back. Yes, ma'am. Uh, first of all, I really enjoyed the talk, and I really learned a lot. Um, I would like to ask about um, how it was doing the research and getting all this information, and like going all the way back to like, um, the time and some of these things. Great question, and it was surreal, you know, because Denise was extremely helpful in uncovering a lot of this. I was uncovering things along the way. I had to work for it. And at one time, you know, I was at the visitor center, and we had maps out, you know, we're doing all this stuff. I was like, this is a real, you know, research project, you know? And I had to, fortunately, and, you know, I'm single with no kids, and I'm taking care of my mother. I'm in a, I'm in a, sp a space and time right now where I can do that, where I can, you know, um, focus on that, and it really did take a lot of focus and persistence. But I always knew that it was going to work out. You know, I always knew that I was going to find the answer, and that's what kept me going. What was the research? Library in Bucks County? The David Library, and we also went to the Visitor Center at the Washington Crossing Park, we went to the Battlefield Park, we talked to every local historian. Clark House, I can't say enough about the knowledge and expertise of Mr. Larry Kidder, author of A People Harassed. Please buy the book. It's a wonderful book. Uh, and then Tom Glover at Hamilton, Roger Williams. You know, well, well, even a month ago, I discovered that the property that the Yankees maneuvered on in Hamilton was Anderson property, it was Ezekiel's uncle. So, you know, like, it was pretty obvious that the Yankees maneuvered on Anderson property to get to Prince of Battlefield. So that's another um, interesting note that I think should be talked about, besides just Ezekiel being a guy, you know, well, we used our farm. Think about that. If they used the farm and then the British won, they'd all get home, you know. So that was that moment, you know, of putting it all on the line they didn't necessarily think, they didn't think we were going to be cool. Most of the folks in, the third, in New Jersey just wanted a Confederate colony. <coughs> you know, they weren't, not most, but probably some, a significant percentage were thinking about, well, we just want our own colony. So, you know, it's great to have these stories, but I'm not sure these fighters, these guys knew exactly where this was all going to go. I think it was just kind of short term, not to take away their, you know, their bravery and, uh, Courage or anything, but you know, of course, they're, they weren't thinking, you know, about where we're at, where we're at now. But uh, as an orphan and create, you know, this incredible technology. That's America, you know. Yes, ma'am. Um, thank you very much for bringing this all up. Uh, the, the causes that you're speaking about. Um, one of the 
one of the things that I found out that helped me put things in perspective, like as we had talked about, I took coming back to the United States, was that we learned uh, at the Battle of Princeton that last weekend, they said, and I haven't verified, but that there are more battles fought in New Jersey than in the other colonies put together. So that helped me to, that helped me to really understand a little bit more about, because you know, you Hospital is basically sleepy. I don't really think it's about being a hot bed of a lot of practice. Yeah. So, I mean, that was interesting right. to perspective on it. And then, as my husband and I have been talking a lot of times, for the African American community, it's very hard to trace back the roots because mm. there are no records. Yeah. You know, things weren't recorded and people change names and, you know, those kinds of things. And a lot of people um, don't have the ability, like my mom and I, to trace things back, you know, all the way back to the 1600s pretty easily. Um, do you have actual, have you been able to trace out African Americans that fought in those battles back out to the descendants that are in the area? No, I haven't. I wish we could, but we haven't. Can you I know. just say that there's, in that library, maybe there's these war records, so there's books of pensions of all the soldiers. I mean, we just like went to the Anderson, but that would be a really good, because um, that's the pension records, that's what they came out, and they're all over there. And then the other, the other comment I was going to make is that as part of our history, uh, the media is a very mixed race. And mm -hmm. when Bermuda, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, we're from, we've been living in Bermuda. My husband is from Bermuda, and I don't have to speak. Very mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, some of his ancestors are both, we know, well, with the last name like Anderson, there's probably some Dutch in there, but we know for sure it's Swedish. Right. He's got a lot of Swedish, yes. but his, brother, his father was often mistaken for my father. So there was a kind of over generations. But one of the things that I wanted to say about the Dutch is that they had, a, in, in New Amsterdam, had a very different um, sense of slavery. Um, they were not involved in a lot of trade initially um, between the colonies and uh, the Caribbean. And they banned slavery um, right long before uh, it, this is being thought about in the United States. So there were a lot more freeholders. And I don't know how that played into this whole um, history. That was just on the edge of what it would be if people were becoming free, you know, and still some kind of slavery or people were going through that transition period is what it seemed. Of course, you also need to consider that new schism of Presbyterian, Presbyterianism. They were now allowing uh, slaves to participate in worship with white. As well, so I mean that, that yeah, the new skin, that new side of Presbyterian that I was telling you about, that all the folks here in Maidenhead and everybody was supporting, that was a more yeah, liberal approach. And then they I would love to, if we were able to get this foundation up to a point where we could get the, the resource to develop a program to look into that, I would love to do that, trust me. That would, that would, I would dive into that if we could, you know. But uh, we're, you know, just getting started. This is all just in the last six months. Well, this is good to see our book. It's unbelievable. Yeah, we do have a book. I would encourage everybody to look into their ancestors. Okay, do we have any more questions? Um, I want to make one clarification because you brought something up about Tories and Whigs. Lawrence, Hopewell, and Trenton were all Whigs, okay? And Stony Brook Creek was the boundary between Tory land and Whigville. Tory land being Princeton. Think about that. So if you were a, a vendor or whatever, you decided to go down, if you were from Princeton, you, you don't want to go to Maidenhead you know, if, you're, if you're living in Princeton because someone will come down from the woods as you're walking down the road with a rifle and then they're, they're going to ask you questions and if they think you're a spy, they're going to hang you. That's how bad it was in 75, 76. You know? And it was right across the creek. So we could say, we could say the front line was Stony Brook Creek, you know? And that's why Washington came down here in this kind of protective womb of the first hundred militia was, you know, we had that 
history of for 30 years leading up to this as being, you know, no one messes with New Jersey, literally. And that's something that we need to be, feel very proud of as uh, New Jerseyans that, you know, like for 15 years they came really good and doing it against us. So, you know, we're all the shots. <laughs> so that's pretty interesting. Any more questions? Well, that concludes this evening's uh, presentation. Thank you, Allison. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a great evening.